I am so drawn to sound, creating artworks in relation to listening to sonic sculptures. Being able to create my own sound was really empowering. There's so much very different kinds of listening. How does it change you, this full body listening experience? Listening really creates a flexibility and a fluidity neurologically. By practicing this listening, you practice a fluidity of opinion, being able to change your mind, being able to transform yourself and hear your own voice. We either have to recognize that we're connected and we affect one another and we have to work together or we will perish. Welcome to Angel City Culture Quest, where art, social justice, and the environment meet in Los Angeles. I am your host, Melina Paris, and I welcome you to this episode. Hello, and welcome to Angel City Culture Quest. I'm your host, Melina Paris. Today, our guest is artist and activist Ilana Mann in discussion of an artist's soundtrack of activism. Hi, Ilana. How are you? Hi, Melina. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here today. I'd like to share some background on our guest. Ilana Mann is an artist and activist who explores the power of the collective voice and the act of listening through sculpture, sound, and community engagement. Since 2014, she has created sonic sculptures that are designed to be used by musicians, audiences, and activists alike. In her artwork, listeners become performers, protests become musical, and music becomes protest. Alana has presented her work in museums and galleries and public spaces in the U.S. and globally. Her recent solo exhibitions have taken place at 18th Street Art Center in Santa Monica, Lawndale Art Center in Houston, Texas, Art Pace in San Antonio, Texas, Pitzer College Art Galleries in Claremont, and Commonwealth and Council in L.A. She has participated in group exhibitions and screenings at the Museum of Contemporary Art La Jolla, the Orange County Museum of Art, and the Hirschhorn Museum. Alana has been commissioned to create public projects by the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, Montalvo Art Center, and the Getty Villa. Along with John Bertel, Alana co-edited Propositional Attitudes, What Do We Do Now?, followed by a book performance tour at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, and Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. Alana has received numerous awards, including an International Artist-in-Residence at Art Pace, San Antonio, the California Community Foundation Artist Fellowship, Stone and Daguerre Contemporary Art Award, the COLA Individual Artist Fellowship, and she was the inaugural artist-in-residence at Pitzer College's Ceramics Department. Ilana received her BFA with honors from Washington University in St. Louis and her MFA from California Institute of the Arts. Indeed, Ilana, you have accomplished so much. One look at your website is testament to this. One can spend hours absorbing it, from your projects, writings, videos, and poetry, to your thoughts on social justice and the power and agency we have as people. In exploring your site, my initial thought was that you could be an educator. So getting to your artwork, within most of it, there's an element of sound. Yet, as a younger artist, you said this was confusing to you when you were in grad school. Then a connection revealed itself. It was your Jewish culture. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I am so drawn to sound. And when I was in graduate school, I was hanging out a lot with the experimental composers and in the music school. And I even remember the head of the art department chiding me and telling me that I wasn't taking enough art classes. (laughs) And I was always just so curious about that because I'm not a trained musician. I have no formal musical background. And yet I was just wanting to be immersed in sound. And so I didn't really understand that as I've just been working in sound and creating artworks in relation to listening, I've realized that so much of that interest comes from my early childhood. Mm -hmm. And being Jewish, 
you're immersed in oral and aural culture from a very young age. Judaism doesn't have a visual culture of its own. It has mm. no native visual imagery in the way that Christianity does or other cultures do. And so my early memories were really formed by these oral traditions and this world of sound. That's really interesting. I hadn't actually considered that about the visual culture. It's kind of remarkable because you just imagine, or I've imagined when I think of Judaism, the Torah. But mm -hmm. it's a book. It's not so much a visual. <laughs> but that's really interesting. Now, how do these oral traditions have a connection to your rattles? It's a great question. <laughs> so I've been making folk instruments for the past, um, I don't know, six or eight years. They're sonic sculptures, and they really relate to Jewish ritual objects but I'm not making them with that relationship in mind. It's always mm -hmm. something that I realize afterwards. But I had this idea to make rattles because I was going to protests and I have a really quiet voice. And protests are these incredibly difficult sonic spaces where there's a lot of street sound. There's often helicopters. There's people chanting and yelling and yeah. there's sometimes counter protesters. And so I wanted to make a sonic sculpture to bring with me that I could just put in my bag that would allow me to make my own sonic space in that chaos. <laughs> and I was also pregnant with my second child at the time. So I think subconsciously uh -huh. too, I was thinking about all the rattle play that I was going to be doing with my <laughs> daughter when she was born. So rattles are really important to babies and their development. And, you know, rattles, maracas, shakers, they're an instrument that is really cross-cultural and they've been used for millennia in different rituals and different spiritual settings. In Judaism, there is a type of rattle called a grogger and you play this grogger during Purim and Purim is a holiday where there is this villain, Haman, who wants to kill all of the Jews and you read a story about him during the holiday. And when his name is read out loud, you play a grogger to drown out his name. So it's kind of a protest instrument in a way, because yeah. you're just protesting this, uh, this villain and this evil man. And so once I made my own rattles, I realized Oh, I'm making my own version of groggers. And I made two at first. I just made one that said no and one that said yes. And I started bringing them with me to street protests. And I just had such a great experience playing them. And people around me would be so enthusiastic about them that I thought, oh, you know, maybe I should bring this more into my art practice rather than these personal objects <laughs> mm -hmm. and experience explore these ideas further because I think there's something there to figure out. Yeah. Before you said it took on a life of its own. Yeah, it really did. I started making them and now I've made over 70 of them and I've been gathering people to play them on the street and they each have a different message on them uh, and a different symbol. And each of them sounds completely different, too, depending on its shape and what sort of filling it has. So whenever people use them, they always choose like a particular one that resonates with them. And the experience with them of different folks that have used them on the street has been really surprising and thrilling to me because everybody has such a different, unique individual experience of empowerment or of the sound unlocking some kind of feeling inside of them or just of solidarity with the rattle crew. And actually, it's been really surprising to me how much this rattle project has also sparked the imagination of other people around the world. So there's a woman in Pennsylvania that got her community together and in dialogue with me has made her own version of the rattles and her community has made rattles. 
she's a potter, so they look completely different than mine, and they have very different messaging and different sounds to them. And she's started bringing them to protests and also selling them as a way to raise money for abortion access. And now I'm in dialogue with somebody from Spain who wants to create a rattle project with people there and play them during International Women's Day in March. So it's been such a thrill and also kind of a surprise that this idea that I see is really simple has, has really resonated with, with a lot of people. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Like you said, it resonates. I remember seeing the woman on your Instagram who was from Pennsylvania was inspired by your rattles at the protests. And so it carried on over there. And it's great to hear that it's spreading around the world and it's fortifying the right to choose, you know, mm -hmm. that, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And now you said being at the rallies, it's a wild place. So some of them have broken, but you said that the rattles are engineered to be as strong as possible in the way you make them. And some of these rattles say change, choice, no, and yes, we, rage, help, voice, shame, no, and no justice, no peace, among many others. And it just seems like the work that you put into creating them is what makes it part of that empowering process. And anybody who holds one would have the immediate sense of that. You said you really enjoyed playing the rattles, but I'd also like to ask, how did you feel the first time you used the rattles at the protest? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think I was so used to feeling incredibly vulnerable on the street. And I still do feel that vulnerability, even when I have the rattles. <laughs> You know, you're really putting your body on the line when you go yeah. and protest publicly. But having the rattles and, and some of them are very loud. So having that possibility of making noise and also feeling like I didn't have to be oppressed by like the state noises, like the noise of the helicopters and noises of police and stuff like that. Being able to create my own sound was really empowering for me. There's also an aspect to the rattle. I have a friend who used to run security for the Black Panthers and the rattles, they're large. They're not like a baby rattle. They're like an adult size rattle <laughs> and they have a long handle, a long wooden handle. And my friend was like, these could be weapons. <laughs> uh -huh. And I was just like, well, I don't really want them to be, but I see your point. And yes, there's this, there's a heft to them. They're sturdy. They're yes. sturdy. They have a ceramic head that's cast. And I love the fact that they're ceramic because it really mirrors that vulnerability of the body protesting on the street. If you drop them, they shatter. And it has, like you said, a lot of investment play is incredibly labor intensive material to use. So it has that time and that labor invested in it. And it also connects to all of the ceramics that are around us in our domestic space, like cups and plates and bathtubs and toilets and sinks. So it sort of bridges that gap between domestic and public. That's a great little bridge. And it's interesting when you spoke about having the rattles and sort of drowning out the state sounds. It sounds to me almost like you're there and you're engaged, but it's a shield for you. Mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, <laughs> I guess it's like it goes back to, you know, drowning out the name of Haman. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the last protest that I went to, there were some counter protesters. And one of the people from my group was drowning out their voices with her rattle. So it was kind of like a shield. Like you said, some of them have been broken. The ones that broke said truth, one said truth, one said power, and one said united. Actually, <laughs> the one that said united broke in the most pieces. It just completely shattered. Oh, God. <laughs> so, per you know, fitting and perfect and sad. And they they will break. I'm sure more will break. But I kind of see that as part of the process. And I collected the pieces of the broken ceramic. And I approached a friend of mine who is Japanese American, this incredible artist named Alan Nakagawa. And Alan practices this technique called kintsuji, which is an ancient Japanese technique to repair broken ceramics. 
And Kintsugi, it values the history of an object. And instead of trying to hide imperfections, it embraces them and it highlights them. So with Kintsugi, you repair a piece of ceramics, but you also gold leaf the breaks. And it really is this whole philosophy that there's beauty and imperfection. And I just love that. So Mm -hmm. Alan helped me reconstruct my rattles, taught me kintsugi, and now they have these cracks that have, instead of gold leaf, we used copper. And the copper sort of looks a little bit like blood or sort of bodily, which I really like. And it's kind of a little bit drippy too. And it's sort of so, organic. In a way. Yeah, it's organic. And so now these rattles have this history to them and this whole other power of like resiliency. We broke and we're still there. Yes. We're still together. We're still making noise. <laughs> yes, yes. That's beautiful. And I think Kintsugi, I read somewhere it's also known as golden repair. So that's kind of a nice way to think about it, too. Mm -hmm. I want to discuss the current group exhibition, an NFT, that your work is also part of. It's titled Unprotected. People can see and hear your work in it until November 4th. Unprotected is a digital rendering of, as you said, a post-apocalyptic Supreme Court. There's ivy growing all over the building, and it has a chain-link fence with barbed wire on top. It's very dark. Unprotected includes other works by prominent artists in the digital realm. Its main image is the U.S. Supreme Court. The entire exhibit is an NFT, and proceeds from Unprotected go to organizations fighting for reproductive rights. Ilana's sculpture is of a green arm shaped into a megaphone. On the opposite end of the horn is a hand which covers the potential speaker's mouth. It includes an audio element, and as you approach the piece, eerie layered sounds by vocalist Sharon Chohi Kim begin to play, and you hear a whisper saying, Can you hear me? Alana, you said you really feel honored to show alongside these accomplished artists in the digital art world. Can you talk about why this was an important exhibition and what this experience was like for you? Yeah, I'm so glad we're talking about this because this has been one of my favorite exhibition experiences of my career. Wow. I <laughs> just love it so much. This exhibition is my first foray into NFTs and digital art. And I was invited by Peter Wu, who runs Epoch Gallery. Epoch Gallery is an online gallery space. So all of its exhibitions are through its website. And Peter creates these environments that are different for each show, depending on the theme of the show. And viewers go to this website and they navigate through this digital space and interact through digital artworks. So for this exhibition, he's keying into artists that are responding to the recent overturning of Roe versus Wade. And all of these artists are very familiar with the digital realm. I work in sculpture and in printmaking and sound and drawing. So my work is really physical, but being able to be in the show and seeing just the possibilities of this virtual realm has really sparked my imagination. I mean, showing my work at the Supreme Court in front of it, inside of it, is just kind of blows my mind. I think it's so powerful just experientially having this be a website that anybody can access that has access to the internet is, I think, just wonderful because there's so many issues with access in contemporary art and people feeling like they can't access certain spaces or they're unwelcome. So this is a space that you know, a website that anybody can visit. So I love that. I think so much about public space and I have all of these ideas for potential installations that are just impossible. They're never (laughs) going to exist. They're so out there, like ideas for LA City Hall, for example, or for the White House or whatever. Mm -hmm. And They just exist in my imagination, but using this kind of digital format 
allows me to think about ways to have my ideas exist in the world rather than just in my mind. <laughs> yeah. And that's exciting to me. The other exciting thing is having a space where the sound is more controlled so folks can experience the sound of my artwork in an environment that is friendly to that sound. And I just feel like so many galleries have a difficult time presenting sound. They're not set up for that. And it makes sense. I mean, they're visual art galleries, but at the same time, there's so many artists that are working with sound and working with moving image and stuff like that. So Epoch Gallery, because you as a viewer are moving through different spaces and experiencing different artworks one-on-one, you can experience the sounds of my piece and it be the right level and it not be competing with other sounds. (laughs) And so I just really love that about the digital space too. That's a really good point about the sounds. It opens up so much more in the art world and for people who consume art. It's many possibilities there. And like you said, now they can exist. (laughs) It's wonderful news. Speaking of sound, I want to talk about a recording session you did inside of a church in Altadena, which also is an exhibition space called Irenic Projects. You described it as a gorgeous modernist building with incredible acoustics and with stained glass that had sonic imagery in it. Can you please tell us the backstory of this recording? And then we're going to get to listen to it. So Irenic Projects is an art space that is run within this gorgeous modernist church in Altadena that I actually have been driving past for the past five years because my kids go to preschool right near this church. Mm -hmm. So I always passed it and thought about this building and how gorgeous it was. And then during the pandemic, this artist, Mike Hernandez, started an artist space within the church that exhibits artwork. And also there's artist studios there. And his whole philosophy is that there's many spiritual congregations are dying and they have space and artists need space and they need opportunities. So he wants to make those connections and also create space for artists that are dealing with issues of spirituality in their artwork. And I just think this the Irenic Projects and Mike's vision is really inspiring and incredible. And when I was invited to create a piece for Epoch Gallery, I wanted to record my rattles and create some sound pieces with them. And I immediately thought of that chapel because the acoustics of the chapel are incredible. I mean, it's, the acoustics of most chapels are incredible <laughs> just because of their <laughs> architecture and right. other design. So I brought some of my rattles there. He generously offered me the space and I just started playing them, improvising with them. I had some ideas that I brought with me and other ideas that I improvised. And I was also just running around the space to make some of the recordings too, just physically moving. And it was so funny to me. It's still funny thinking about it because here I was, this political Jewish artist making a sound piece in response to abortion rights and reproductive justice and body sovereignty in this church. (laughs) And so it's just perfect. I I love this image. (laughs) And then in creating the sound piece, I went through my archive and issues of women's rights, of body sovereignty, of abortion access. These are issues that have been important to me for a very long time. And I have in my archive of sounds, a number of recordings relating to these ideas. And so I brought those in to the final sound piece that we're about to listen to. Some of the recordings are related to this protest in 2013 when there were these congressmen in Texas that were trying to pass a restrictive law on abortion access And this Texas congresswoman was trying to block the passing of this bill. And she was on the floor for 11 hours doing a filibuster, trying to block this bill from being passed. And at the end of her filibuster, this crowd had amassed and they just started cheering 
and chanting and yelling and booing. And I was watching this whole thing being live streamed on my computer and recording it. And I was just transfixed by the entire thing, (laughs) the 11 hour filibuster, the state house filled with protesters, their sounds. And so I pulled from that recording and played along with it, with it. And then also there is a recording in the sound piece that I made in 2017 from a International Women's Day March. And Mm. it's a text by the Black activist Asada Shakur. And there's sort of a call and response part. So I don't know which part of the sound recording you're going to play. So it has rattle sounds. It has the sounds of this protest from 2013. It has the sounds of this march from 2017. And it's called Rattle Watch. Yes. Let's listen to it now. An amazing recording. That was wonderful to hear. Thank you for sharing it with us, Alana. It's an amazing recording. If you're just tuning in, today we're speaking with artist and activist Ilana Mann in discussion of an artist's soundtrack of activism. Thank you for listening. Hello, culture lovers. This is your host, Melina Paris.
For several months, we have been bringing you inspiring guests along with stimulating content about their work. As with anything, there are costs to keep this podcast going. So if you're able, join me in this quest with your support. Think of it as a cultural tip jar to share any amount that you're comfortable with. Or you can make a regular offering with as little as $4 a month. This will contribute to my ability to continue bringing you the great work of these artists, activists, and others, plus the cultural content that you want to hear about. I appreciate you, and I would be honored to have your support. To join, please go to our Patreon link at patreon.com forward slash Angel City Culture Quest. There, you can also see all of our past episodes, get early announcements, and find more perks to come. Thank you. Now I want to talk about your works on paper. They're very important because besides being visually striking and curious, they provide a sense of history and of justice. You work in prints, drawings, posters, and collage. You said with collage, by using imagery that you make or find, you can play with your ideas of listening or sound or politics. Now this is materializing into the beginnings of a compelling collage piece for the Public Defender's Office commissioned through the County of L.A. Can you share the history behind this piece? Yes, I was so excited when I saw this opportunity because... The Public Defender's Office in L.A. County is the first one in the whole country. And it was started by the first woman lawyer on the West Coast, Clara Shortridge Fultz. Now, Clara Shortridge Fultz is this just absolutely amazing, incredible, powerful person. She was a single mother of five. And despite many efforts to stop her from becoming a lawyer, she persevered, started working as a lawyer and was a very active suffragist as well. And she had this idea where she really felt like people that were accused of a crime constitutionally deserved a defender provided by the government. She felt like that was their right. If they were presumed innocent, they needed a proper defense. And so she came up with this idea. She lobbied for it for years and years, got nowhere. (laughs) She was a huge part of women gaining the right to vote in California in 1911, which was one of the first states to grant women suffrage, California. And after suffrage was passed in California, she was able to create a coalition of these women that were now voting and create the public defender's office. Amazing. Yeah. This history is so little known and it's so important. And now the public defender idea is all around the country and the world. It's really spread and it's enshrined into law. And so I felt like I wanted to make a piece about this history, recognizing Clara Shortridge Fultz, and then connect it to our most recently appointed Supreme Court Justice, Ketanji Brown Jackson. Ketanji Brown Jackson was a federal public defender. That's how she started her law career. I know Federal public defender is different than county public defender, but still the same idea applies. Yes. And she spoke so much about being a public defender and the idea of public service and how important that is to her. So I want to create a diptych portrait of Clara Shortridge Fultz and then a portrait of Ketanji Brown Jackson. It's timely and important because... Ketanji Brown Jackson is also a first, the first black female Supreme Court judge. And this has fostered a growing awareness and importance of having public defenders move into the judiciary. So it's going to be so important to have and to have that visually depicted in your collage is going to be amazing. So thank you. Looking at this history has honestly been really comforting. Just seeing people like Clara Shortridge Fultz that have worked along with hundreds and thousands of others on these major campaigns against oppression and fighting for equality 
and having real victories, women getting the right to vote, establishing the public defender's office, seeing that and reading about that and being immersed in that archive too, seeing pictures of these incredible activists. It really (laughs) is comforting to me because I know I'm part of a lineage and I can just hold that in my heart as I continue on with my own art and activism. Yeah, they made changes that we are living today Mm -hmm. because of them. So as we get ready to vote coming up, November 8th in the midterms, vote people, this is really good to hear about. Because as I said, it's important history. And the fact that it's comforted you through your work, it's good advice. It's good advice for all of us. Now, let's talk about one of your influences. Sister Mary Corita Kent, Year of Wonders Redux from 2021, was an exhibition of protest instruments, works on paper, and moving image at the 18th Street Arts Center in Santa Monica. Redux had eight works on paper. Five were part of a series of prints inspired by a print which was inspired by Corita Kent. Can you talk about how she has influenced you? Corita Kent is an artist that I just keep returning to over the years. I think I got to know her around 15 years ago, her and her work, and she was based in Los Angeles. That's where she started creating her groundbreaking posters and visual imagery, and that this is where she developed her ideas about pedagogy and education, and even just the idea of art in everyday life. And so I often go back to her work work, her ideas, her philosophy, as again, like this ancestor, this elder, this teacher, as a way to understand how I want to move through the world and what sort of artwork I want to be creating. And during the height of the pandemic, I was looking again at Karita Kent's work and thinking, like, what would Karita say? And I (laughs) found this poster that she had made in the 80s with a quote by the economist Barbara Ward. And the quote said, we are either going to become a community or we are going to die. And it just felt like this is the quote for our time. (laughs) This is the pandemic. (laughs) It is. We either have to recognize that we're connected and we affect one another and we have to work together or we will perish. And that's related to the pandemic. That's also related to the environment too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had made this linoleum plate with wave imagery. So I took this wave pattern and inked it and pressed it with my hands and legs to pieces of paper. And then I hand lettered the quote by Barbara Ward on top. And something about Corita Kent that I also feel a kinship to is her connection of spirituality, aesthetics, and politics. She comes from this background of liberation theology as a Catholic, and she believes in the power of spirituality to liberate people and just believes in liberating the oppression, like liberating people in general (laughs) Um, and fighting for equality and justice. And I come from that spiritual background too. I come from a sect of Judaism that was very political. It's called Reconstructionist and Reconstructionism is based on humanism and feminism. And so I know that a lot of people's experiences with spirituality is not related to liberation (laughs) and that for most people, liberation and religion don't go together. But for me, They did because I saw people in my congregation working towards women's equality and working for healing of the world. And those tenets were a really important part of my spiritual community. So I feel really lucky that I had that and not the opposite of like religion is trauma, religion is oppression. You had mentioned you started public school when you were 12 and how much of a shock it was for you coming from this Reconstructionism environment and into the conventional society and the stark differences in the patriarchy. It was such a shock. There were so many shocking things. I was in such a bubble when I was 
in my early years, I mean, I was surrounded by all Jews <laughs> and very politically liberal Jews that were feminist for the most part. And then leaving that bubble and entering into a broader society yeah. was horrifying because <laughs> I just <laughs> realized, oh my gosh, patriarchy, misogyny, these things are real. And I have to learn ways to deal with them. And after I left this bubble, there was a shooting in an abortion clinic in the town next door to where I live. And a few years after that, there was the whole Anita Hill hearings oh, and wow. Clarence Thomas hearings. So it's just like one thing after another, as I'm kind of becoming like a teenager and gaining my own independence and then just seeing this world of like racism, sexism, misogyny, environmental destruction around me and realizing that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> yeah, but you had these tools from your early upbringing. So mm -hmm. what a gift. I mean, that's amazing. It's definitely an awakening. And the tools that you were given have served you very well. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I feel really, again, just so fortunate that I was brought up in that, in that yeah, environment. Yeah, it, it sounds wonderful. Humanist and feminist. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's also a print in Year of Wonders Redux called Self-Portrait as Radical Empath from 2021. That was inspired by an idea you had during the Occupy protests when folks were using the people's mic, which you called a full body listening experience. Can you talk about that print and the people's mic for us? Sure. So the print is based off of a drawing that I made of a sculpture that I wanted to create. And I use drawing a lot to work out ideas of sculptures or other kinds of installations or whatever. And some of those ideas never get made and some of them do. <laughs> this one has yet to be made, maybe someday. But my idea was that it would be a bust of somebody's head, a cast of their head, and their mouth would be open. And the back of their head would be attached to the bell of a trumpet or tuba or sousaphone. So a giant bell would be emerging from the back of their head. And there would be a channel connecting the person's mouth to the bell, like mm -hmm. an interior channel. And so it would kind of work like a megaphone, but a megaphone incorporating ideas of desire of other bodies, encounters with other bodies, because you would have to press your mouth or put your mouth on top of or inside or around the mouth of the sculpture in order to have your voice be amplified. <laughs> I got this idea from this technology called the People's Mic. The People's Mic is a protest technology that's been used for decades, and it's a way to amplify a speaker's voice when there's no electronic amplification. And so a speaker talks, and they're surrounded by a crowd, and then all the people that can hear them repeats what they just said. And not only do they repeat it, but they have to repeat it in concert with the people around them so that the people behind them can hear what the speaker said. And it kind of moves in waves through a crowd, depending mm -hmm. on how large the crowd is and how big of a space it is. And this technology, it still just fascinates me for so many reasons. Number one, you have to listen really well. You have to listen so well to what a speaker is saying. And then you have to listen really well to the voices around you so that you're in tune with them. And then the people behind you can hear what the speaker said, that they can understand you. So there's so much very different kinds of listening happening. And also you are repeating the words that somebody's saying. So you're taking their voice and making it your voice. Like you're using your body and your voice to amplify somebody else's voice. And I just really am so compelled by that. And I just think like, what is it? How does it change you and your body by saying somebody else's words, this full body listening experience? I think a lot about listening 
because it's such an important political organizing tool and it's so critical to empathy to real debate and disagreement and i believe in both i believe in mm-hmm. empathy i believe in disagreement those things together really provide a basis for a transformation of your own interpersonal relationships your relationships with your community your family and also transforming society listening it really creates a flexibility and a fluidity neurologically because you have to hear what somebody else is saying and also simultaneously hear your own voice and sort of balance between the two what is that person saying and how am i responding to their words and not getting stuck in either one not getting stuck in your own response or not getting stuck in another person's words or ideas or feelings or whatever so i feel like by practicing this listening you really practice a fluidity of opinion of being able to change your mind being able to transform yourself or you really understand. hear what someone else is saying that's important you can understand whether you agree or not yes and why you know and, what yeah. is it inside of you that's being triggered or like what memories yeah. you know what early experiences are coming up for you you can shift between like inside and outside back and yeah. forth the fluidity exactly mm-hmm. and you had two more works that have to do with social justice a gavel with megaphones and an image that you found of an aeolian tone can you tell us about those The gavel with the megaphone I came up with the idea after listening to a talk by Dr. Cornell West and he said this phrase allow suffering to speak and that really mm-hmm. that phrase was so resonant within me and I thought about a gavel the symbol of justice with megaphones and i thought a lot about the impediment to justice and also how to create justice <laughs> to have so justice be heard so i was thinking about this symbol i drew a sketch of it and then i was looking at it this gavel with two megaphones on either side and i realized oh it kind of also looks like a double headed axe and so i started doing some research into double headed axes and it's actually an ancient grecian symbol that's associated with women and associated with questioning and with journeying and it's called a labrys and so so i loved how this symbol that i was creating connects to this ancient symbol that also felt very important to me and then the piece with the aeolian tone i found this image online i was looking at the shape of sound and the physics of sound and how sound moves through air as it's moving as these vibrations are moving through air the kinds of forms that it makes and so many of these forms are spirals and circular and they kind of mimic even the interior of our ear so i was looking at these spiral images and i found this aeolian tone a picture of it some tones we can't even hear with our own ears but an aeolian tone is a tone that we hear when a force of air is being projected against a blunt object so it's when a gust of air is hitting a power line and this aeolian tone is created um and it's these vortexes it looks almost like a hurricane like a vortex street wow. and when i was looking at these shapes i was thinking to myself these shapes really remind me of social movements there's something that happens there's a person a moment a group a incident and then there are these spirals that come out from it <laughs> yeah and also that form really was reminiscent of this sculpture that i was working on called our work is never done unfinished business and it is a six person protest horn 
It's 10 feet long and six people speak through the horn wow. and it amplifies their voices. <laughs> so this Aeolian tone with these nodules really reminded me of this sculpture that I was creating. A 10 foot long horn. That's amazing. <laughs> and you said that you're finally going to get to activate that horn for the first time in January. It's been exhibited, but you're going to activate it next year. Yes. So I started the project back in 2019. I had found this 10 foot protest horn in the Claremont Folk Music Center and Museum. And it was originally made by this folk music presenter, producer, creator of the Claremont Folk Music Center, oh. this man named Charles Chase. And he created it in the 1970s as a protest instrument that he brought with him to protest. He's a very active communist and socialist. So I was just captivated by this horn. I wanted to create my own. I started working on it right before the pandemic started. And <laughs> as soon as the pandemic hit, I thought to myself, this is a super spreader. This is yeah. like the most dangerous thing I could be making. Like, I'm never going to be able to use it. And, you know, time passed. There was this incredible, you know, movement for racial justice that we saw happen yeah. in the summer of 2020. And I felt like, okay, I can finally finish this horn. And I eventually finished it, but I still didn't feel super safe using it. And now I feel like it can finally be used where a lot of people are vaccinated. It's, the pandemic is still around and it's still dangerous, but safety it's like, measures. In place. Yeah, there's a lot of safety measures in um, place and we know how to be safe or we try our best to be safe. <laughs> we know like, yeah. the best practices. So yeah, so I'm working on a performance right now that's going to involve all of my sonic sculptures oh. and it's going to premiere that particular one that's never been used before. It's going to be January 4th at Human Resources, which is a gallery and a performance space in Chinatown, in downtown Los Angeles. That's so exciting. We'll definitely have to check that out. It's created as a multidisciplinary collaboration. The title of the performance is Hope is a Hammer by Corey Fogel, Sharon Cho Hee Kim, Alana, and Carol Ackman. It features sonic sculptures and costumes by Alana, performances and compositions by Corey Fogel and Sharon Cho Hee Kim, and a text by Carol Ackman. January 4th at Human Resources. Well, Ilana Mann, can you please tell us where to find you? You can find me on my website, ilanaman.com, and on my Instagram, ilanamama. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.